Okay, so today we're going to be talking about free software and open source software and what it means for something to fall into one or both of these categories. Now, anyone who says that this is a simple thing to understand and understanding the difference between free software and open source software isn't complex whatsoever is one, lying to you, two, didn't understand it themselves and is trying to make themselves sound smarter than they actually are, or three, so involved in this sphere of software they forget that normal people actually exist. And I definitely know people in that third category. As for the other ones, I'm sure they exist, but the third one, definitely, definitely know those people. So, you probably saw the title of this video and thought, what do you mean open source software doesn't mean open source software? Of course it does. That doesn't make any sense. Well, when you think of the English definition of the term open source, what do you think? You think the source is open, you have access to the source code, but this isn't what the legal definition of open source actually means. Having access to the source code is actually only one part of something being open source. And because of this weird distinction, it's very easy to get it confused, especially when you're not talking to techie people. If someone says, okay, this software is open source because you can see the source code, technically they're not wrong because they might be referring to the English definition. But when you're referring to the legal definition, the license definition of open source, it means a lot more than that. In fact, it actually must meet 10 different criteria defined by the open source initiative. And you can go see a full list of the criteria over on the open source initiative website. Now, I'm going to be paraphrasing this because I don't want to be here all day, but I would highly suggest going and reading this for yourself, just so you can have a bit of a better understanding of what I'm actually saying. So the first point we have is free redistribution. So something that has been defined as an open source license will allow you to share the source code, share the application, and include it in other software that you build. Now the extent that this is allowed to happen is dependent on the specific license, but if it's been defined as an open source license, this will be allowed in some extent. Now the next point we have is source code. So what source code means is you have access to the source code or you have some way to actually access the source code. Now, source code is actually a bit of a stricter definition than the English definition of source code. So obfuscated source code, so if you stick it through something to intentionally make the code harder to read, that won't actually be counted as source code. I don't know if minified code would meet this criteria or not, but I imagine that it wouldn't. Also things like intermediary forms of code, so if you pass it through the Java compiler, that intermediary form of code isn't actually considered source code, same as the output of, say, the C compiler when it's been put down into machine code. That is also not source code. The only time machine code is considered to be source code is if the application was actually written in machine code. In that instance, obviously, there isn't any other form of the code, so that will be considered source code. But if you wrote it in a higher level language, the output of the compiler is not considered to be source code. So derived works is pretty straightforward. Basically what that means is the license must allow for modifications and derived works. So derived works would basically be, you know, here is Chromium, here is Brave. So Brave is something derived from Chromium, but it's not the same thing. So it must allow them to be distributed under the same terms of the original license. Now, integrity of the author's source code is where it gets a little bit weird. So an open source license may actually restrict how modified versions of the source code actually can be released only if the license allows for patch files to be released. So a patch file is something that modifies the original source code but isn't the entirety of the application. So a patch file for something like a piece of Suckler software, for example, would be a, obviously a patch file. So the license must also explicitly permit the distribution of software built from the modified source code and the license may, this isn't a requirement, it may require the derive work carry a different name. So for example, if you wanted to fork Foo and Foo's license said you must have a different name, you could then call the derived work bar because bar is a different name from Foo but they are still derived from the original source code. And the fifth criteria is pretty straightforward. So no discrimination against persons or groups. So you can't say my software can't be used by gingers or my software can't be modified 
by short people if it's going to be an open source license. An open source license mustn't discriminate against the people who are going to be using or modifying that software. And the next one is also pretty straightforward as well. So no discrimination against fields of endeavor. So some people might not like, I don't know, some things the US government does, but an open source license can't say, okay, this specific government agency cannot use this software because we don't like them. That wouldn't be an open source license. If you want to do that, then it cannot be considered an open source license. Now, distribution of the license is also pretty straightforward as well. Basically, what this is saying, the rights attached to the program must apply to all whom the program is redistributed without the need for execution of additional license by those parties. Basically, that means that the license distributed with the software is the license that's distributed with the software. And those terms are going to apply to anyone who uses that software. They don't actually need to then go and get some extra license on top of that. And the eighth criteria is the license must not be specific to a product. Basically, what that means is if you go and release a software package that includes, say, program Foo, and Foo has a specific license. Its license isn't dependent on the license of the package. Now, the package itself might have a different license than Foo, but Foo's license is the same regardless of whether it exists in that package or not. Now, the ninth point is the license must not restrict other software. Basically, that means that if you go and use, say, some other application, so in Foo, you use Bar, and Bar is licensed differently to Foo. Foo's license must not restrict bar, so that license must be as open source or more open source than all of its components. And the tenth point is the license must be technology neutral. Basically what this means is you can't say this license only applies if you're using a Ryzen 3600X, or it can't say it only applies if you are using this specific operating system. That isn't really something that can be included inside of an open source license. This isn't to say that you can't make software that only runs on those things, but it mustn't be included in the actual license itself. Now, free software is a little bit different. So it's believed that the open source initiatives criteria of free software was derived from the four essential freedoms, but the open source initiatives definition of open source is more focused on business viability rather than the freedom of the users. So there might be things that are freedom restricting that can still be open source software, but they wouldn't actually be free software. So the four essential freedoms of free software are the freedom to run the program as you wish for any purpose. This should be pretty straightforward what this means. The freedom to study how the program works and change it so it does your computing as you wish access to the source code is a precondition for this. So once again, with the open source definition of open source, for free software, source code isn't considered to be source code if it's obfuscated, if it's, you know, intermediary, if it's a machine code output of compiler, those aren't actually considered to be real source code. And the second freedom is the freedom to redistribute copies so you can help others. Now this one also like with freedom zero is pretty straightforward. Basically, it means you can go and redistribute the software. You don't have to go through whoever originally made the software. And then the final freedom is the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions to others. So you don't necessarily have to just redistribute the original software. You can go and modify it for yourself. And by doing this, you can give the whole community a chance to benefit from your changes. And obviously, access to the source code is a precondition for this. And once again, like with Freedom 1, the same rules apply for source code. And when you actually go and distribute your copies of the modified software, the license that you release under doesn't necessarily have to be the exact same license. In fact, depending on the specific license the original software was released under, you may actually be able to release your software under a more freedom restricting license. Now, this really depends on the specific license you're using, and it can only be done with a license that doesn't have copyleft in it. So copyleft basically means that you can't add restrictions to distributed copies. So a free software license doesn't need to be copyleft, but it is preferred. And this is where one of the big differences between free software and open source software actually exists. So because free software encourages copyleft, Basically, you might be saying, well, isn't that more freedom restricting because then you can't go and license your software the way you want to actually license it. When in fact, 
The way that the free software crowd looks at it is that copyleft actually protects the freedoms of the users. Whereas open source software is more concerned with business viability. That's not to say that free software doesn't care about business viability at all, but it puts the users of the software first before the business. So what about some real world examples for how they actually differ then? So one thing you might not know is that most, if not all free software would also be considered to be open source software. So let that sit in for just a moment. So most, if not all free software would also be considered to be open source software. So in this respect, free software is a less restrictive set of guidelines for licensing your software. Now under certain conditions, it can be more restrictive, but I'll talk about those in just a bit. So one real world example is with Android. So Android, the just the base version of Android is licensed under the GPL. So it is free software and it is open source software. Now, if you have a Android ROM that basically blocks you from installing certain apps or from installing even a new ROM, this would not be considered to be free software because this would be trying to restrict your freedom. But it would still be considered to be open source because there's nothing in the open source criteria that says that it can't stop you from installing certain apps. Okay, so what about a real world example of what copyleft can do then? So. For example, we have VS Code. So the source code for VS Code available on GitHub, on Microsoft's GitHub account for VS Code is open source software and is also free software. And VS Codium is free software and is also open source software. But Microsoft's binary of VS Code is open source software, but is not free software. So why is that not free software? Well, that is because the license for the binary of VS Code that Microsoft distributes is actually different than the license they have on the source code itself. So the license they add to the binary actually adds more restrictions than the original license actually had. Now, this wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing because copyleft isn't actually a requirement, but the stuff they add to the license is actually freedom restricting to the point where it stops being a free software license because it's adding things like telemetry. So ultimately then, which one is actually better? Is free software better or is open source software better? And I'm not gonna give you an answer here. It's going to depend on who you are and what you're actually trying to achieve. If you care about the freedoms of the users of your software, then free software is objectively better than open source software. If you're a business who wants to have open source software for the benefits of open source software, but you care more about the business viability than the freedoms of the actual users of the software, then an open source license is the way to go. Now, I'm not going to say which one is better for you. It will really depend on who you actually are and what you're trying to do. There is also a very long history between the Free Software Foundation and the Open Source Initiative, which I did not bother to get into today because I genuinely don't care. If you want to go fight about what is better, go fight about what is better. But I just wanted to lay out, here is what the differences are for the people who don't actually know the differences. So I think that is pretty much everything for me. But before I go, I would like to thank my supporters. So a special thank you to Joachim Corbinian, Craig Nathan, Andrew Montezar, Joseph, Peter D. Road, Tony Donald, jo so a special thank you to Joachim Corbinian, Craig, Nathan, Andrew Montazar, Joseph, Peter D. Road, Tony Donald, John, Mikel, Spagin, Thais, and Zilda. If you want to go support my work, there'll be some links down below to my Patreon and subscribe to and all of that stuff. If you want to go watch my rambly videos, go check out the podcast because the podcast is just nothing but ramble. That is available on the Tech Over T YouTube channel and library channel and the audio version available wherever you listen to audio podcasts. Also, I'm going to go check out this channel available on library, BitTube, and BitChute. And also remember to go smash the like button and leave me a comment down below. And remember to subscribe and ding the little bell icon down below as well. So I think that is pretty much everything for me. And I'm out.